Welcome to the Digital Adoption Show by Watfix. We are the folks who practice and preach digital adoption, and Watfix is one of the leaders in the space, paving the way with hundreds of Fortune 500 customers worldwide. Through this podcast, we bring to you industry leaders and influencers who define how learning, training, adoption, change, and digital transformation should work in today's world. Tune into our discussions on how organizations tackle the different pain points, challenges, and find the resounding solutions to the most interesting problem statements in the world of digital adoption. Now, here's our next episode. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Shubham. Uh, I head the EMEA business at Watfix. Uh, we are the pioneers in the high growth category of digital adoption solutions and learning in the flow of work. For organizations globally uh, in our increasingly digital world, Today, we are going to speak about the movement from the learning paradigm to a performance paradigm and the challenges and opportunities that organizations now face globally. Uh, To share thoughts and insights on this topic, we have the pleasure of having with us Charles Jennings. Uh, Charles is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on building and implementing learning and organizational performance strategies. Charles has led learning and performance improvement projects for multinational corporations, government agencies, not for profits and other organizations for more than 40 years by now. He has been the chief learning officer at Thomson Reuters, developing and implementing uh, learning and performance strategies for 55,000 uh, employees globally. Charles has also been a keynote and invited speaker at many international events, including the Gulf Economic Forum conferences attended by heads of state, presidents, and prime ministers. In context to our conversation today, Charles has, been, uh, Charles has worked on the 70-2010 model for more than 20 years by now. Uh, The performance-centric approach is based on uh, uh, observations and research that suggest high-performing organizations and individuals develop most of their capability through learning within the workflow. In other words, learning from working rather than learning to work. Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to have you today and to be speaking with uh, you today. Thank you very much for the invitation to to share this time with you, Shivam. It's a a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, Charles. For, you know, the pleasure is ours as well. Uh, just to get things started, Charles, you know, uh, with over 40 years of experience in the learning and training sector, what are your thoughts on learning while doing? Uh, the approach and fundamental differences between learning and training. You know, we often see people confuse the two. So what are your thoughts about them? Yeah, that's a, a really good question to start with, uh, Shubham. I think in the in the book that my colleagues and I wrote called 70-20-10 Towards 100% Performance, we talked about something we call the training bubble. And to be honest, many L&D departments and learning professionals, still they're still in the training bubble. They've separated learn from working. And they've also separated learning from performance. And that's created a major challenge. And I think this, this difference between, well, this idea that, that training and learning are the same things, and the training and learning and performance is the same things, is is really misconceived. In fact, Jay Cross, who is a very good friend of mine and former colleague, and one thing Jay often said before he died in nineteen in two thousand and fifteen was that he used to say, "Charles, many people can't separate learning from schooling," and I think that's essentially the problem because training is really schooling. And uh, it's where we, where learning and working are, are separated, and yep. and training and learning, training and learning sometimes touch, uh, yep. but but certainly they're not the same thing. And the research tells us, on the other hand, that the vast majority of learning that occurs actually occurs as part of or as a, as a result of working. You know, yep. we learn by doing, and yep. and we really need to need to take that into account, the fact that we, you know, we learn essentially by, by doing. And, and actually, if we look outside of our world, we look to, for example, the economists, the economic view of the world, the macroeconomists, the economists have been telling us for years that the vast amount of work that we, sorry, the, 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 the learning comes from doing. In fact, uh, I often point out that Kenneth Arrow now, Uh, Kenneth Arrow was probably one of the USA's greatest economists ever. He won his Nobel Prize right back in in 1972. Arrow Arrow said, learning is a product of experience and learning can only take place through the attempt to solve a problem and therefore only takes place during activity. 
And other economists have said the same thing. So the challenge that we have is to think about learning in terms of helping us solve problems because we learn from we learn from doing, we learn from solve problems. And I've asked I've asked maybe a hundred thousand people over the last 20 years this single question. I've asked them, think about the greatest learning experience you've ever had in your life. It might have been when you were a child and you were learning to ride a bicycle, or it might have been, you know, when you were a, a, a student, when you were studying, or it might have been when you were working in a team on a difficult project or a project that went well or didn't go well, or it might have been yesterday. Where did that learning occur? And Shubham, the answers to that, I can almost guarantee that most people will say that that really great learning experience came whilst they were trying to complete a task. It wasn't in some formal learning environment. Of course, you know, formal learning does give us great, formal training does give us great learning, yeah. you know, yeah. great learning insights. But actually, the, the learning that really matters happens as part of work. And I think that's, that's the challenge that we've, you know, we've, we've got to accept and we have to, have to face. Yeah, uh, I think I, I totally align with you. I think the point that you're raising is more of experiential learning. And I think that's where in, in your 70, 20, 10 years, the, the, the focus of 70 is on the learning by doing. That's when across different scenarios, individuals and organizations learn. So thank you so much, Charles, for sharing your insights on that thought. I think, you know, just extending your comments there, Charles, to a real life scenario for enterprises and industries globally. How do you see l &D team addressing business challenges in, and be a direct uh, business enabler, uh, you know, with this new model? Well, I think that we have to start to think about things differently because, you know, learning has always been, it, it's it's not new that learning occurs as part of working. Uh, that's, you know, that's as old as humanity. Uh, yeah. But the, the challenge that we've got is is thinking about how we, how we adapt and change uh, about and, and adopt new practices. And for me, I think that the teams that use this sort of new age learning approaches, yep. they tend to work. They tend to work outside in. And what I mean by that is, they focus on organisation or project results that they're aiming at. That's the first thing they focus on. So you don't focus on on what learning needs to happen. You focus on what work needs to get done. You focus yep. on what outcomes you're looking at. They focus yep. on executing. You know which critical tasks need to be carried out well. And you're always looking at opportunities for improvement, which is why I tend to like to use the term creating a culture of continuous improvement rather yeah. than creating a culture of learning. Often when people talk about creating a culture of learning, they're really talking about creating a culture of formal learning. They're not looking beyond that, what I would call that 10, that structured learning, which which is necessary and can be very powerful, but it's only a small bit of the of the whole pie. Yeah. Because because we've got to remember that, that most learning comes from working rather than the other way around. Uh, but you know, if we want to go beyond basic competence, which is which is what formal learning help, helps us to do. I've never met anyone who's completed a ended a formal learning program and felt that they were an expert. Uh, I've, I've met lots of people who've undertaken a good formal learning program and felt that they need to have enough in order to start to apply things. Often they yeah. run into problems when they do start to apply things, but I've never met someone who said, I'm an expert because I've been on a, on a course. It just doesn't happen. We all know that. I mean, we know that naturally. You become an expert through experience, practice, conversations, networks, and reflection, and it takes time. You know, you don't become an expert overnight. Again, I know of, of no expert uh, over, uh, you know, who's, anyone who's become an expert overnight. And so I think that those are the key things we need to think about in terms of this, this whole new, uh, new approach. And uh, just at the time we're speaking uh, uh, today, uh, Shubham, there's just uh, there's something that I'm sure you and I are both interested in, there was a cricket test match that finished a couple of days ago here in England. Okay, yes. now I'm an Australian originally, so I support what they call Abe, you know, anyone but England. But uh, so, of course, I was I was supporting the uh, supporting the Indian team who had a, a, a wonderful victory. And I think that when you look at at elite sports people, no matter what they are, 
And just thinking about the the great performances that we saw in the in the most recent cricket test match, you know, Joe Root had it was a, had a wonderful innings in terms of batting innings. There were some great uh, some great uh, uh, performances by uh, the Indian bowlers and also the Indi- Indian bowlers doing something that they're not supposed to be good at, which is batting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, when you look at these people who are really experts and think about how do they develop their expertise and the answer is they developed it through a lot of practice through working with people who are really good exemplary performers that they can work with and learn you know the techniques and the approaches that achieve, yeah. where, whereby they yeah. can achieve good results so i think if we step out of our our learning suit our learning clothes and think about sporting uh, sports elite sports people for example yeah. We we immediately see the importance of learning by doing. You know, no one achieves a gold medal at the Olympics without yeah. lots and lots of practice, without studying uh, what they do and how they do it, and reflecting and things like that. That's what re- that's the learning that really matters. Right. Uh, so you know, I think so, so many key insights there. There, you know, really thought provoking. You know, I love the analogy that you made uh, with uh, sports. But I think one point that I really uh, you know loved it when you said that. You know, as organizations, we are looking at the end objective, what we want to achieve, but we are missing the enabling uh, piece there. And I think I just want to, you know, uh, uh, go back to you on, on that point, you know, with, you know, with the scenarios changing, with, you know, so many technologies coming in, organizations maturing towards new solutions, new technologies. And it's fundamentally, you know, if I draw orally with sport, these are new environments for people, you know, in respective industries and organizations. And there, if I understand you right, you're saying we are using these new scenarios to achieve, uh, you know, to, with, with the aim of reach, reaching a higher goal, but we are missing the bus on enabling people. So do you want to share more insights with, you know, these new uh, changes? How do we start enabling people there? Yes, I think uh, I think that's absolutely right. I think that we we've developed our formal learning approach is really well. I mean, there are some excellent instructional design, design methodologies and, and approaches in terms of, of building individual skills and knowledge and skills. Yeah. But yeah. if we're going to have real impact, if we're going to have real business impact, there's a piece there that's missing, which is really around making that connection between the fact that individual knowledge and skills is just one part of the whole ecosystem uh, yes. the whole the whole system that delivers high performance for our organizations and again you know we've known for years that if we simply train people up on in terms of competencies and expect expect the work to be done to a very high standard and expect business results there we're going to be missing things we have to think about the whole we have to take a systemic view and look at the whole the whole approach and if I can give you an example, about how L&D can address these business challenges yeah. to really add business value. Uh, we work with a company called Hilti. Now, many yeah. people will know the, know the company Hilti. It's a global construction company. And they approached us uh, at the 702010 Institute a few years ago. And uh, it's, their challenge was that they had – their challenge wasn't a learning challenge. Their challenge was a business challenge. And one of their business challenges they had was around about a third of their newly hired sales managers were either leaving or being promoted within 12 months of of being recruited. So the company was growing rapidly, but also there was lots of pressures on on sales managers. And as we all know, you know, sales managers need to need to deliver tangible business results or else. They don't get their bonuses, and the company's not happy. So you have you have you know two sides, two unhappy sides to the the piece. So what Hilti found was that it was very expensive to hire new staff, and that this turnover, uh, high level of turnover, was really damaging the company. So okay. so we worked with the uh, Hilti L and D team to help them expand their thinking uh, from the learning paradigm into the performance paradigm. Uh, and we work with some of their regional sales managers. And they, when they analysed their onboarding processes, they found that the, the programmes were too long. And impo- the important fact was that the programmes didn't address the critical tasks 
that sales managers need to undertake. So there was that lack, there was that gap between, it was what, what we call the knowing doing gap, the gap, gap between yeah. training people in terms of making sure they know what to do yeah. and actually making sure that they do it because yeah. it was based around competencies and things like that. It wasn't based around critical tasks, you know, the work that needs to get done and in the work that needs to get done, what are the critical things that people need to do? So yeah. what we did with them is uh, uh, work with them to redesign their onboarding so that it didn't f- it focus simply on, on critical tasks and it moved out of just the 10. So it moved into how do we support them in the workplace? How do we provide them with performance support and the right tools and things like that? And interestingly, Ashuvan, Hilti had one measure business was really interested in. They weren't interested in learning measures. The one measure they were interested in was what they called time to productivity or time to payback. Yes. In other words, how long did it take a newly hired sales manager to start to earn money for the company rather than simply pay the cost of recruiting, training, getting them into post and so on? And when they first looked at this, the time to pay back was somewhere between a year and, and 18 months. In some cases, it was even two years. So that makes it pretty obvious why there were, one of the reasons there was turnover, because if you're a salesperson and maybe you have a bonus, uh, if you're not starting to deliver value for the company, you're unlikely to get your bonus yeah. and you know, you're going to be unhappy, the company's going to be unhappy, and you're more likely to leave. Yeah. So, so basically what we did was, uh, or what, what the Hilti uh, team did, with our guidance and our support, uh, and they used our, our uh, performance-based learning program in order to, to do this. Basically, what they did was they uh, they redesigned their their onboarding program and measured the time to productivity, the impact. The output of that was that that time to productivity and payback came down from around eighteen months to somewhere between three and six months. And so wow. that was, uh, and particularly in their in their groups in in the, in Southeast Asia, particularly, it was really clear that the the business impact was absolutely immediate and profound. So they could, and they could measure it. So they they could measure the fact that if someone was if someone was onboarded, that they could start to produce value for the company within three months within three months rather than eighteen months. It's a clear business case, you know, a, a high value business case, and I think. I give you that example because that requires a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. It's not thinking about learning. It's thinking about what is the business impact that we need to help with and what are the mm-hmm. solutions that we can develop to do that. And, and the key for this was very much around the, the area that, that, that what fixes work works in, which is performance support. In other words, how can we p- help people do their jobs whilst they're doing their jobs? So, and that's the key. It's it's about preparing them to do their jobs, but mainly yeah. about helping them do their jobs while they're doing jobs. How can we make sure that the errors are reduced, that the performance is improved, that the outputs are delivered, that speed to speed to delivery is increased, and all those sorts of factors. So, so that I think is the major rethink that's required. So it's a it's a change in mindset, but also a change in practices and and the methodology that we've developed over a number of years now really sort of is focused around that. It's focused around what we call moving from the the learning paradigm to the performance paradigm, moving from being an order taker to being a performance enabler or a value creator. So moving your your whole business model. Got it. Got. It. I think uh, I know. I I really get a strong you know sense of you know the emphasis that you're making that how it is essential to move just from learning to performance. How do we map the uh, enabling factors to business objectives? And I think your example with Hilti, you know, you know these real life examples really help envision uh, people to, you know, understand, you know, what that uh, transition means and how we can achieve that. So thank you so much for sharing that, those insights there, Charles. And I think I'll maybe, you know, push you even further on this topic. And, you know, when you're talking of enabling uh, le- learning towards business objectives. What do you think is the best way to transform learning methods to performance metrics and that focus on inputs to outputs of a business? If you can share some insights there. Yeah, again, that's a really good question because I think people have been struggling with this for years. 
And the challenge is it's almost impossible, certainly in my experience and the experience of my colleagues, it's almost impossible to demonstrate business value by using learning metrics. You have to rethink uh, your approach. And there's been, I mean, people like Jack Phillips, who's these ROI methodology and so on, you know, that can work in a small number of cases, but it's quite often really difficult. The the answer in terms of your your metrics yep. is if you, it requires, again, it requires changing mindset. It requires you to think from the business perspective. And so think of what are the important, what are the things that are important to the senior leaders, the, the senior business leaders? What is, what is it that keeps them up at night? You know, what keeps them awake at night? It's not the fact that they're, learning solutions aren't, aren't being delivered correctly or that people aren't, aren't learning enough. It's things like the fact that our customer satisfaction levels are not high or could be higher or the fact that our, our uh, uh, first-time resolution of problems is, is not a high enough percentage level. Those sorts of things, those sort of business challenges might be or that our sales pipeline isn't strong enough. Or, or our, our delivery, our execution isn't fast enough, or it could be a whole range of things. Uh, I think we need to start to think about those. And when we think about those, then the metrics that we use automatically come from those. So, you know, if, if you find that your CSAT levels, your customer satisfaction levels are, aren't high enough, and you feel that part of the problem is a capability problem, and so therefore there is some sort of solution that learning and development needs to to be involved in we're not looking to make sure that people know you know all about their products and services so that they can answer the questions that's that's part of the thing that's a learning metric you know if we say well we want to make sure that people know about our products or people can uh do whatever uh but the key is are, are, the, are, they, are those people carrying out their tasks so that the first level resolution increases, so that the customer satisfaction levels increase? So we need to tie ourselves to those business metrics uh, and there's any number of approaches we can take. And we may want to use learning metrics internally just to help us review our own approaches and so on, but not don't try and use learning metrics as the end point because you'll never convince, again, I've sat in many, many meetings where senior learning people have presented a whole series of learning metrics, such as learning activity. We've had, you know, we've taken everyone through this program. Everyone has completed this to this level. To be honest, business people don't care about that too much. Uh, yeah. What they care about is, you know, how is that helping me with my, my business, my team, uh, my part of the business? How is that helping us deliver our objectives in terms of what we need to deliver. Yeah, uh, Charles, I think, uh, you know, you're raising a very fundamental point here that while we are having ambitious business objectives, are we, the question to ask is, are we missing the boat on enabling people with the capabilities, training, learning there, and how that ties in very tightly with the business objectives. And as you rightly mentioned, the business metrics, they cannot be independent for from an LND standpoint and from a business objective standpoint. They have to be broken up to reach to reach the end objectives. There. So thank you so much. I think that's a very uh, interesting insight uh, that a lot of organizations globally would want to take a note of as to how enabling people to business objectives is also very key to achieve the, uh, the end results that you're looking for. And sure, uh, but I think just as a, as a final point there, I think it's it's always important to ask the question why. So, you know, if we're doing something, why are we doing it? And, yep. and if you continually ask the question why, it helps you get to the end point. It, because, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we designing this program? Why are we, uh, why are we doing yeah. whatever we're doing? Yeah. Because if you keep asking that question, the answer you will finally get to will be a business outcome. Yes. So it is for some one or more business outcomes. And it might be, as part of that process, it might be that we're helping people develop their own capability and develop their own careers and things like that. Uh, so, and that that's important. I shouldn't I shouldn't step away from that. I think helping people develop so that they have career progression and they can have a fulfilled and, and successful career is important. But if if learning and development only focuses on individuals 
and only yeah. focuses on career development, they are dis they're dissociated from the business and they will be a sideshow to a certain extent. I mean, yeah. everyone naturally, every organization wants to provide a great learning opportunity for their employees and great opportunities for development, of course. Yeah. But actually, yeah. but actually the key, the key role of L and D is to have business impact and to, to make sure that the, our businesses can survive, our businesses can thrive, because if we don't do that, we can spend our lives helping people develop their careers, but their careers are not going to be in that in our organization. They're going to be somewhere else. Yeah, I, I think Charles, uh, you know, very you have very sweetly uh, mentioned not just the why, but the why, what, and how. Yeah. Why are we doing the learning? What are we achieving out of it? And if it, if there are gaps, what can how can we you know enable them to achieve the business objective? So I think uh, anyone listening to this uh, discussion would already be intrigued to think about you know what's really ha happening and what more can be done there. Uh, and maybe just a last question there, Charles, to you know to give more insights for our audience there. What does digital learning experience involve? You know, why should learning professionals be aware of it? And also, if you could give an example of how to use those methods there. Sure. Yeah. I think the whole concept of learning experience seems to be, as I said earlier on, captured really by HR and L&D and trimmed into this formal learning experiences. And in fact, you know, we know that a lot happens outside that uh, and a lot is to do with, with tacit knowledge. And so I think if we, if we can create opportunities for stretch work and for new and challenging experiences and then follow up with opportunities for conversation and reflection, uh, we'll, we'll actually create, it, we'll create these connected learning experiences. Yeah. And I think that's really important where we can weave learning into what we do. I think that's, that's really, really the critical, the critical things we need to do. Got it. Clear. So uh, I think thanks a lot for all these insights, uh, Charles. I, I think definitely thought-provoking and uh, I love the fact that you know you are taking a metrics driven approach wherein how changing in the current learning methodologies, you know how are we able to create a, a, a targeted uh, business enablers there and what is the value addition that companies are a, a great example of Hilti, you know what the impact that was created. So thank you so much for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Before I close up, you know I would like to you know, do a short uh, rapid fire round with you. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's always fun to do them. Uh, I'll just request one word responses from you. Uh, uh, now, just to start with, I know this might sound amusing to you, but what word comes to your mind when you think of 70 20 10 rule? Uh, extending, extending learning. Excellent. That's, that's uh, thought provoking again, uh, Charles. Uh, what is most important to you, access to knowledge or retention of knowledge? Access. Access trumps retention every time. Sweet. I think that this this is one response that a lot of our audience is going to you know, keep thinking about. You know what? You know why are we emphasizing on this fact? Yeah. Uh, Charles, uh, any books or methodologies or blogs that you would recommend to our audience? Uh, you know to take to take some notes on. Well, of course, I, I have to say that the book that uh, my colleague Jos Eretz wrote the bulk of, but my my other colleague Vivian Hein and I contributed to, called Seventy Twenty Ten Towards One Hundred Percent Performance, yeah. is one. I, I, of course, I'd have to say, uh, and the key to that is it's about performance. You know, the performance sits at the centre, so that's really important. And the methodology that we we describe in that book, and we work with clients all the time, helping them build capability, their teams with method methodology is really important. And I think that. The other other uh, thing I'd, I'd, I'd mention is that I think learning professionals and anyone involved in terms of held, helping to build high performance across organizations should dig into HPI, into human performance improvement. Right. It's been a blind spot for many, many people for many years. And for a lot of learning people involved in learning, I think HPI opens a door to an entirely new way of working for uh, for current and future needs, I think that's that's really really critical. I think that uh, and what we've done is we've taken HPI, which is really looking at the the power of effective business analysis and performance analysis, and then built on the back of that the way in which you can develop appropriate solutions which are fit not just for today's world but actually for the for the future. Got it. Uh, I think this, these are like golden inputs for my audience, Charles, to be honest. I think uh, 
you know, what what are the new aspects that you know we kind of missed totally and something which are critical you know from a business standpoint uh one last question charles uh, this is something we ask all our guests on our podcast what is the one word or phrase that comes to your mind when we say digital transformation and digital adoption new thinking new practices you thinking new practices very well said charles i think uh, uh, i think everyone is going to now take really go away with, uh, with with the emphasis on the transition between the learning paradigm to a performance paradigm you know how are they co- correlated why are they important what is the impact that they are going to have on a business level uh, we have come to our, to the end of our chat today charles i just really wanted to thank you again so much you know it was a wonderful conversation with you and i think something that i'll remember for a long time in my life uh, before we close charles uh, it would be awesome if you could share how people listening to this podcast can reach you if, if they have any further questions certainly sure and, and i should say it's been a real pleasure talking to you as well uh, the best way to reach me probably is through linkedin uh, yeah. linkedin or twitter but linkedin is probably the easiest way uh to reach out to me uh and i'd be really delighted anyone who listens to this to uh if you you send me a note on linkedin uh be delighted to respond to you and if anything i can do to help that would be great so it's been a real pleasure awesome charles i have to tell for people that that's how i got connected with charles as well so you know that i i can just wait that you know he is active on linkedin and he'll acknowledge your notes uh thank you charles and it was a genuine pleasure to have you on our show today thank you to everyone who's been uh, listening to this discussion feel free to reach out to us for for a deeper insights on this topic and and pay more thoughtful insights on our different podcast channels thank you so much everyone ciao thank you very much thank you